where you are on life's journey. We do have several announcements to make this morning. Our annual congregational meeting is going to be on January 27th, two weeks from today. It's going to be immediately following our worship service, uh, but lunch is going to be served first. So that is two weeks from today. The flowers on the altar are sponsored in memory of Bev Carr's mother, Ruth Commodore, in, in remembrance of her birthday, January 18th, by Bev and Dennis Park. And today's bulletin is sponsored in loving memory of Fran Oaks, in remembrance of her birthday, January 15th, by her husband, Bob, and the entire family. Um, today is going to be the um, ice ice skating party with the youth group, and you'll notice information on that is in the bulletin. Um, that begins at 11.45 uh, after worship. And the chili supper, the annual chili supper is going to take place on the 9th of February. Um, if you have talent, or even if you lack talent and want to entertain us humorously, you're invited to sign up on a bulletin board. Um, chair of the youth choir rehearsals begin again this week. There is an announcement about the Jingle Bells is going to be starting up again in March. Um, Prime Time Senior Outing is going to the cafe this Thursday, and TNT is going to meet on Tuesday. The annual health fair is going to be having the ever health fair the last Saturday of February. This is all hands on deck at um, information on that is found in the book. So please take note of that. Let us gather and center ourselves for worship with this morning's prayer of Jesus.
Let us sing to God the glory of God's name and worship God in holy splendor. Let us share God's peace. 
They were butchered. They worked in a meat shop. You know how you know that? You know what the, you know what the word, the name manzo means in Italian? Beef. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It, it, it means beef. Now that's not the name that was given to the in church. Thank you. But, it reminds me that I'm part of a family with ancestors in this country and Europe and what they did years ago. So, our, and our names in church are, they were part of a family of people that go back. Way, way back. And that's part of it. And that's what's cool about baptism and Christianity. It's a special day. And that's why we remember it in church today. That um, baptism is something, no matter what age you do it, is something extra special. And All right? I remember talking about my little, little name. Yes. Edward. Very good. And my last name means what? Please don't tell anybody. The adult. You know everybody heard that. Everyone in Edward came here because there's no soft stuff here. There's no soft stuff here. See? Do you think the adults might have heard? Maybe. Maybe. Yes, they did. All right. Let's pray very briefly. Thank you, God. For this time together. And thank you for blessing us each and every day and giving us names and making us part of your family. Amen. Okay, you can go to Jupiter. Let us pray. Most holy God, how the water of baptism continue to make us holy and enable us to grow. And my might my make my words and all of our meditations be accepted to you this day and always. Amen. April 10th, 1955 was one of the most significant days of my life. It was on Easter Sunday at St. Joseph's of the Palisades Church in West New York, New Jersey, and I was baptized. The baptism was done in Latin, so I couldn't understand it. But to be honest, on April 10, 1955, I didn't understand English either. I was 18 days old, and I obviously have no memory of the day. 
And no one who brought me to the church that day is still alive. But I know it is one of the most significant days of my life because I was baptized. I cannot even begin to emphasize how important that day was and is in my life. For Christians, baptism takes place one time, and it is, as a people of faith, a landmark moment in our lives. Even when we are babies, it is a time of complete and utter transformation. I've had the honor and the privilege of baptizing people over 35 years, young and old, every age. And the words are said and water is placed on people. And I remain to this day in awe of the moment. Something profound happens. It is a moment of immense and intense transformation. Several things happen. The first being is we are claimed by God. In the moment of the baptism of Jesus, Jesus is claimed by his Father in heaven as his beloved Son. There is a process of claiming our children, not as property, but as part of our families. We give them names. We tell them stories about their families. They grow up on food we grew up with as children. We celebrate their birthdays even when they do not know what is going on. My kids grew up eating clam cakes in Rhode Island and calling female family members aunts in Rhode Island. And they grew up eating really good pizza in New Jersey and had family members who were called aunts. They never got the two mixed up. They grew up eating Jewish coffee cake, Janet's mother's recipe, every Christmas. And they spent time walking on the boardwalk in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, like I did, my parents did, and my grandparents did. The stories of families get told in this way. It's part of the claiming we have for one children. One generation claims another generation as their own, and it goes on. At baptism, God claims us. And in the process of claiming us, we begin to hear the stories. We hear the stories of Abraham and Isaac, of Moses leading the people out of Egypt, of David and Goliath, of the Lord being our shepherd, of feeding 5,000 people, turning water into wine, of Jesus dying and being raised. These are stories that we grow up in with in the family of the church. These are the stories we grow up with. And we grow up with them because we are claimed by God. And we are baptized because God invites us into the story. We are invited and we become part of the story. The story of our lives and the story of our salvation becomes part of a larger story, part of a family that goes on for generation after generation. All because we are claimed by God as being one of God's beloved children with whom God is well pleased. Baptism, secondly, reminds us that we are part of something far greater than ourselves. Within many aspects of Christianity, there is an oft-used statement that our goal as Christians is to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. And of course, this is truthful. We are called to have personal relationships with God. And we are people who need to and learn to, on many levels, interact with God one on one. And that is definitely part of the story. But another part of the story often forgotten is that we are also part of something far greater than ourselves. During the Advent and Christmas season, we focused on the 200th anniversary of the beloved Christmas carol, Silent Night. I heard a lot of comments on how people really liked it. It was something that was very special and very moving. And when we came to Christmas 
Christmas Eve and sang Silent Night in the candlelight, it was very moving and touching. We were recognizing that we've been singing the same song in church as Christians for 200 years. For 200 years. Not many places where we celebrate the singing of a song for 200 years. And if we take a step back to it, Joy to the World was composed in, in um, 300 years ago. So in 2019, this year, Joy to the World is going to be 300 years old. And on Christmas Eve, when we end the church service, we're going to sing Joy to the World, recognizing we've sung the same song for 300 years in church. How many 300 years old songs do you know? How many 300 year songs do you turn on the radio and sing along with? Not many. Churches are increasingly referred to as anachronisms, vestiges of a past that no longer exists, doing old things in old fashioned ways that many people seem to think is no longer important, doing rituals that people claim are now worthless. But the more I think about it, the more I embrace the fact that it's a role that people are desperately seeking. Many people refer to us as old-fashioned churches. And in some ways, that is good, holding on to some of the vestiges we have. Our world has become, for lack of a better word, less real, less tangible than it used to be. We sort of live in our society in sort of a cyber world, and we depend on something called the cloud. Where is the cloud? What is the cloud? It's some mysterious thing out there. It's holding all of our information, our family photographs, Virtually everything is out there on the cloud. I even asked Alexa in my house to describe what the cloud was. And even Alexa couldn't give me a good answer. Social media has become a dominant factor in life. Increasingly people are saying all the information they need they can get from Facebook and Twitter. God help us all. Seemingly not realizing that anyone can post anything on there. No filters, no accountability. And to be quite honest, even churches scare me. Because they don't remind me of churches the way it was new. Theater seating, bands playing, nothing over five years old, coffee during the sermon, pastors don't need seminary education. The seminary education means history and learning history and learning traditions. And sometimes those are things that are no longer wanted or needed. But maybe in a world that has become increasingly cloud-oriented, increasingly cyber-oriented, maybe we need to recognize that we're part of something far greater than ourselves. Something that brings us back to tangibility. Lastly, baptism invites us to live lives of ongoing conversion. Conversion, to put it very frankly, often refers to being saved. And we have often heard pastors and teachers tell us that we need to be saved. Evangelists talk about being saved. I know that I've been asked that question a thousand or one times in my life. And it's obviously important. But there's a notion sometimes that in the moment, People talk about being saved, and that's that. That's not really what the Bible is telling us. The Hebrew word for saved means deliverance. And the Aramaic word, and Jesus spoke in Aramaic, said that the word saved actually literally translated means being made alive. Often when people talk about being saved, they're talking about what happens after they die. Just in terms of what happens after they die. I think Jesus, I think about Jesus, I think Jesus was actually talking about being delivered from a life where we torture ourselves about our shortcomings and we are made alive to actually 
live life and grow in life. Living lives of ongoing conversion. Getting better at it. And when we understand it this way, it opens up as a whole new possibility of things. We can be delivered from almost anything, can't we? I pray this, that as I write a sermon, that I am delivered from theological and biblical errors. And worst of all, being boring. I guess I pray that you be delivered from me being boring. But I pray also that I'm delivered from sickness. From a meteor falling from the sky and hitting me on the head. From getting in a car accident when I drive to work. From enemies invading our country. From our economy sliding into collapse. From earthquakes, floods, storms, and so it goes on and on and on. I pray that I am delivered and made alive. And in the spiritual sense, I pray that I am saved from being slipping into sin. So that I can destroy my life, my life and my witness. And I can be saved from ruining my marriage and family and treating them with the love and the respect they deserve. Living a life of deliverance, of being made alive, of ongoing conversion is something we do each and every day. It's not just what happens when we die. It's how we really live. Because how we die is often a reflection of how we live. And it's so important and so necessary and so good. So why baptism? For me it goes back to April 10th, 1955. I was 18 days old and while I was not aware of the actions of the day, I can legitimately say it set the direction for my life. It is a day, an event that reminded me and continues to remind me to this day that I am claimed and called by God. Today, that reminded me then and reminds me that, that I was something, part of something far greater than myself. And it's a day that invites me to live a life of ongoing conversion, to be a better person of faith, to be a better person each and every day. Baptism is an incredible gift from God. We're invited to embrace it. Always. Amen. <coughs> this is a day on the church calendar that is always classified as the baptism of the Lord, and it's a day where we're invited in the church to renew our baptismal promises. So I would like you to invite people to rise and let us renew our baptism. God created new life works and brought them up from the waters of chaos, embraced them, and called them good. Jesus baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist, became living water for us, and embraces all of us. Jesus embraces also you who are the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, and all others seek who come seeking. We follow Jesus with our baptism, marking a starting place for a new life and new ways to be. We join Jesus in love and service. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to see here once again the valley of baptism. You be you renewed and affirm the promises you made at your baptism. Do you recognize the call of God to be God's people? Do you embrace the way of Jesus in faith and ministry? Do you accept the nurture of the Holy Spirit who renews your spirit each day? Do you accept and embrace others who seek liberating faith in God? In renewing your baptismal vows, remember your baptism as an acceptance and welcome into the care of Christ Church, where you may begin again your Christian faith and life.
to you that still in critical condition. So she asks our prayers for Ed and the entire family. Also, she requested to know visitors. Um, just about a really difficult time for the family, and they requested that no one come to see them. Um, Frank Eckert, many of you remember Frank, um, our custodian, who um, Mr. Buffing, the floors man, Frank Eckert. Uh, Frank is having a knee replacement tomorrow, so let's ask for our prayers. Um, Connie Howard Carroll had surgery this week on her shoulder and is recovering. Uh, Reef Fleming is having surgery this coming week, and Susan Vincent is home recovering from surgery in part. Are there other people you'd like us to remember? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, Sarah, a family of Sarah Smith who was killed in a fire in the Silver Hills. Yes? Mom's going to have knee surgery. Ron Judd had knee surgery in his home in the cover. Yes? And Joel has a baby, John, John Burks. Yes, Jonathan Burks is here with us this morning. <laughs> Pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Christ, 
open our hearts to God. Let us open our hearts and minds and celebrate the generosity of God with our own generosity as we give to God.
change and to serve. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. May our lives be worthy of this calling. We bring to you this token of all you have given us. Fill us with lowliness, meekness, patience, and love. Amen. I invite everyone to turn and face each other as with permission. Let us go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint hearted. Sword bleed. Oh, for a thousand. 